everyone and welcome to a new episode of The Welding Rake, a webinar series on mental well-being. My name is Dennis Persichini and I'm the undergrad well-being champion for the School of Psychology and Clinical Language Sciences and I'm very excited to be the host of this webinar series. So with these episodes, we really hope to give you some ideas on things that you can do daily to improve your mental well-being or just reflect on your well-being if there's something new that you can try or change for your daily routines. So today we're speaking with Dr. Vanessa Kurdi and we're going to talk about the self-determination theory and a little bit about listening, empathy, so lots of interesting research aspects. But yeah, so to start with, Dr. Kurdi, could you please introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about your area of research and interest? Yeah, uh, well, just introduce myself. I'm Vanessa Kurdi. I'm a researcher here at Reading. Uh, I am really interested in how parents and teachers support students and or children. Uh, with their motivation and well-being in general. So I would study what teachers do in class, what practices that they put in place, how they interact with their students, and then see whether children do feel better, to do feel more motivated in class or not. Uh, for example, I'm also interested in doing a, an intervention now where I would do a workshop with teachers to see if I could improve the way they show empathy to students and whether that does help students feel more motivated in class, engaged, or if they just feel better when they're in the, their teacher's class. I mainly do work with primary school students, but the principles that I study are the same in secondary schools, universities, and even in the workplace. That's that's quite interesting. May I ask if you like if it's a more qualitative research or quantitative research? May I ask you a little bit more? That's quite interesting. Uh, so far, more uh, quantitative research with surveys, but I'm. What if I have the funding to do the intervention, uh, I would be interested in co-producing the workshop with teachers and head teachers, and then having some qualitative uh, mini studies to see what the feedback is and does it really change lives or <laughs> if it doesn't change anything. We have to measure these things. Yeah. Well, that's that's so interesting, and, and good good luck. Best of luck with with that. So today we're here to talk about well being, mental well being. So, what's your idea of well being, and why do you think is important? It's such a complex question. Yeah, uh, very important, of course. I mean, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, so <laughs> I'd say very important. Um, when you think about well me well being, there's a lot of different views. If you go in research or psychological theory, uh, generally it's I see that optimal psychological functioning. It's quite vague and large, but I know well-being can mean different things. Is it feeling happy every day or being content with your life overall? In my line of research, there are kind of two different distinctions or ways to think about it. So there is the hedonic well-being where it's more focused on pleasure or comfort or having fun. So in your daily life, you would say, I feel well because I have lots of positive emotions and very little negative emotions these days. I feel happy, I feel joy, I don't really feel stressed, uh, or it, it balances out in my day or in my week. The other way to see, to see your well being is eudaimonic. I hope I pronounce it right. I, I always read it, I never say it. Eudaimonic. So that's the well being that is more on the meaning you find in what you do, the meaning of your life. Uh, it's when you seek to grow and to live according to your values or your authenticity. Um, it's more like developing yourself, uh, using the best in yourself, which is quite different from the other view. And it doesn't mean that every day you'll, you'll get the, that feeling of well-being uh, if you have that view, but over the long run, maybe more. And that's what studies find. Um, hedonic well-being will be more kind of, uh, you'll see impacts on short-term short -term outcomes. So your life satisfaction over the next month but uh, eudaimonic well-being will be more associated with long-term outcomes, Le your long life satisfaction, uh, or they what they call well-being experience overall. So how that's the two different ways that I think about it uh, in, in my life and in my research. Quite interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thinking about students, so focusing on students' well-being, especially during this peculiar situation that we are facing, what is the best advice that would you give to, to students now? What kind of well-being, what, 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 what would you say? Yeah, well, there's yeah, those two parts, but there's also the self-determination theory, which is another thing that I could talk about maybe just after. But I think you kind of need a, a nice mix of both. You need to have some fun in your day, otherwise it's going to be pretty either boring, sad, or 
uh, I don't think you'll be able to survive long if you have zero pleasure in your life or zero comfort. Uh, but at the same time, to do activities where you need sustained motivation, when you need to do something long term, just like if you're doing a, an undergrad, you need to have a long motivation because it's a long time. So maybe having a meaning there or knowing that it, it's meaningful for your life goals or what you want to do with your life or your, your self-development, you kind of have to have some reasons or motivation there to continue. So I would say you kind of need both. If, if you do have noticed that one of, the, one of them is kind of lower, maybe think about how you can improve on, on that part. Can you have a little bit more pleasure or comfort? Or uh, if you find you don't have a lot of value or meaning in your life, maybe that's finding what will bring it in your life. Can you do any activities that, uh, well, a lot of people talk about volunteering, but it can be just uh, studying a topic that will bring you closer to what you want to do or within your relationships. Uh, it's, it could be very meaningful to either just talk with others, help others, or yeah, feeling part of something. That's interesting. So kind of a mix of both or like thinking about being happy now, but also in a couple of years, couple of months or in the future, a mix. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't want to say that one is bad or anything like that. Like, I understand some nights you just want to have fun. And yes, you should have those those nights or days. And uh, But I think you have something more long, long term as well. Okay. And earlier, you mentioned the self-determination theory. Could you tell us something more about it? That's a, such an interesting topic. Yeah, that's the main theory that I use in my in my research. So it's a theory of human motivation. And they say that everybody, all humans have three basic psychological needs. And when those three needs are satisfied or fulfilled, then there's more chance that you'll be motivated uh, in life, engaged, and that you'll feel well psychologically. So the three needs are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So I can explain a little bit. Autonomy is to feel that your behaviors uh, come from your own values. You make your own decisions. You kind of have that uh, ability to make choices in your life and decide where it's going based on your interests or your goals or whatever beliefs you have. Uh, competence is you kind of know what to do in a situation to attain a goal or avoid a goal or an outcome. Uh, and the last one, relatedness, is that you need to feel connected to people that are significant to you, you need to feel cared for, or that you belong somewhere. Uh, and to also, it's that one way, but there's two ways. You also need to feel that you can contribute to other people's lives, or you can help your friends or be friends with other people. So those three needs are, that's explaining them generally, but you'll find them in different circumstances in what we call the social context will satisfy them. So when you're at school, the way your teachers or your professors interact with you can support or can frustrate those needs. The way your parents interact with you can support your autonomy, your competence and your relatedness, or it can threaten it. And the same with your friends. So it's the way we are supported or not within those different relationships in social context, I would say. The more people will support our autonomy by allowing us to live our life the way we want, the more they support us uh, or support our competence by helping us achieving our goals or telling us what to do. Suppose you're in class, you need to know how to get the, the grades you want or how to get the, the certificate you want. And uh, relatedness, the more you can develop those relationships with the people around you will lead to, to well-being. Okay, now I'm going to ask about questions. So I, I, I think this is super interesting. Um, but I'm thinking, what about in the practical side? So as the, as, so we have these three needs. And is, is there something practical that we could do? Like, do you have any anything more, more practical to share, if that makes sense? I don't know if it's a bad question. Yeah, it's quite theoretical for, for now. But practically, if you think of, you can think of your needs for different domains in your life. So if we think, I'll, think, I'll say school because that's what I study, but at school, uh, you can try to say, do I feel autonomous at school? Sometimes you don't have a lot of choices. So, but is there a way where you can do things on your own or can you choose an essay topic? Can you, do you have any leeway on how can you think about your school work as relating to your goals? Does it have some meaning for you? Uh, does it bring you closer to what you want to achieve or your values uh, or can you just connect it to something fun because when you're studying a specific theory or topic it doesn't, it's meaningless just as is can you try to apply it to things in your life that interest you or can help you understand it but also make it fun 
you can also use uh, to support this autonomy need. You can, they, they also suggest using more empathy because that's like I was saying, you support those needs with other people, but can you acknowledge other people's life circumstances, what they're going through, their perspective, but their emotions saying, like just saying you feel frustrated, you feel sad, but you can also do that with yourself, which people will call more self-compassion. So when you're feeling frustrated with school things, like you can just acknowledge to yourself, I am frustrated, I am mad, and try to process that within yourself instead of just pushing through or changing, trying to uh, entertain yourself, change your mind, things like that. Uh, or can you add activities during your day that would bring you more fun or pleasure or stimulate your curiosity. Everybody can be kind of in that flow moment where they really like doing an activity. It's kind of playtime for them. If you have a little bit more of that during your day, it can help your mood and help uh, ultimately maybe help your well-being or spending time with people who support who you are or your interests, your choices, your behavior. So that's just for autonomy. So there's so much you can do for competence. Can you break down uh, your goals into smaller steps so it's, it, you feel more in control? So if you want to be able to do activities or uh, sports uh, while running, the first thing you have to do is just to put your running shoes on. You don't have to go to run for 20 minutes. If you want to do yoga, just unroll your mats on days you want to do yoga, then build up. You can always start smaller than you think, but ultimately go for longer periods of time. Uh, can you yeah, pick a topic that interests you. Uh, for competence, there's always the, the idea of challenge. When things are too easy or too difficult, you're not really engaged. So you'll, you're more likely to abandon or not put effort in it. So finding that optimal challenge, if you can, whether in your hobbies or at school for an essay, uh, in your hobbies, a sewing challenge or a baking, uh, you wanna bake something new, well, pick something that might be in that good zone of challenge. And for relatedness, I would say this is all about developing your relationships. So continue to invest time with your friends or people you, or that are significant to you. If there are conflicts, uh, do your best to resolve them. Um, can you, uh, for the school part, help others understand lessons so you feel useful and you connect with people? Can you do homeworks or study with other online? Even I do that. I worked with people online just to have that feeling of community. Uh, if you're moving to a new place, can you join a team or an activity just so you have those interaction? Because that sometimes we underestimate how much we need to feel those relationships and they're really important for our well-being. Thank you. That was absolutely useful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I really enjoy it. I really like this topic. So thank you. Thank you so much. Is there something else that you would like to share with us today? I know we mentioned empathy earlier. Yeah. Uh, is that where I can talk about how we listen to other people? Um, yeah, well, I mentioned empathy quickly with the, with an autonomy, but I think empathy is quite fundamental for all our needs and for our relationships in general. What I mean by that is the how we listen to each other, because I know lots ha that's been happening in the past year, but in general, uh, there's a way when people talk to you about something that you can respond that will support them, that will help them accept what's going on and their feelings, that will bring you closer to the other person and help their well-being. But it will also help your, your well-being if you feel like you're helping and that you're developing a closer relationship. So empathy if you think about the conversations you have with people around you and if, for example you were to tell me uh vanessa i really don't feel like studying today studying sucks i miss people in real life university was not supposed to be like this this year and i take it in during that moment i can think of different things in my head but the way i will respond to you will have an impact if i were to tell you well suck it up that's life I'm not supporting your, your need. I'm not acknowledge your perspective. I could also say, start questioning you on whether, well, you think you're really made for university. Maybe you should change your career. Maybe you should do something else. Then I'm probably not helping you either and making you feel incompetent or, or the ne negative emotions. Uh, I could also respond by comparing you to someone else. Well, have you seen Jenny? She's doing well. Maybe you should do more like her. And then I'm making you feel more incompetent or like, well, J Jenny should be the only one at university and I shouldn't even be there. 
So, but if I respond with empathy to what you said, to what you said, if I say, oh, you're really not feeling it today. And it is really hard to be motivated without seeing people for a full year and being indoors, then ah, there's a relief there. You probably feel like, oh, Vanessa gets me. She accepts my feelings, whatever they are. And I can just say that and it doesn't have it's okay, I can just say it and move on or say it and then move on to solutions or other ways of thinking. So the way each of us responds to when somebody tells us something, whether it could be very something very distressful or it could just be something a bit lower on the scale. It doesn't have to be somebody in the full of depression or things like that, but the way we respond to each other every day and the way we listen to each other has an impact. And when I listen with empathy, I'm asking myself, what are you feeling? What's, what's the other person's feelings? What are they going through? And what does that mean to them? Because I don't, for, for me to have empathy, it's not imagining Vanessa in Dennis' shoes. It's imagining what is Dennis seeing and doing and feeling if I were to know your life. So it's a bit further than saying, oh, just put yourself in the other person's shoes. Well, I have to have your beliefs, your values. What do you want to have to, what do you have in your life and what do you want to achieve in your life? Uh, and what does that mean for you in terms of feelings? So, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, absolutely. It was all, all clear, uh, super interesting. So what I was thinking now is, especially thinking about what we said earlier, so once, so with empathy, so I'm listening to someone, so doing a good thing for, for my friend, for example, but at the same time, am I doing something good for myself as well? Because I can feel part of a community, I can feel a good friend, which is kind of related to what we said earlier, to the other theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think empathy will, will can respond to at least autonomy and relatedness, maybe competence, if you feel competent when you're doing this. Well, I would say it's not something that we're used to doing. I wasn't, for example, brought up being a, knowing how to respond and to acknowledge the feelings that other people are, are feeling. Or when somebody tells me something, I think I used to be, I wanted to help. I think it's all from good intentions. I would propose solution. I will try to help you make you feel better now. But the tip, the trick is that we don't have to make other people feel better instantly. We can just acknowledge the negative feelings that are there. And then the person kind of needs to digest that before they can move on to something else. Uh, but we haven't learned that that much, it's kind of a new language almost. So when my partner tells me something, I don't respond, well, you should do this and then solve the problem. I can say, oh yeah, that's annoying. I'm sure you're looking for a solution or do you want, and then you can maybe ask, do you want me to think of solutions with you or you want to think on your own or you just want to bitch about it for a little bit and then we'll move on. No, that's absolutely useful. And, and yeah, because sometimes we do have friends who, you know, share some stories, some deep stories, some feelings, but sometimes we just, we, we don't know how to react. But sometimes, as you mentioned, like just acknowledge their feeling and that could be super helpful just to acknowledge the feelings. That's a very good advice, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's, that's the way to go. You can think of the demonstration of empathy as the first aid for negative feelings, the first thing you have to do. So when you hurt yourself on a, you trip and fall, then you can disinfect the wound and put a plaster on it or something. But when you're hurting emotionally or you're in distress without somebody else can use that empathy to acknowledge what you're feeling, kind of just accept and recognize what's going on first. Thank you. Thank you again for, for sharing that. Any final words of advice for students? Maybe especially thinking about the exam period. So exams are coming. Any advice on that? Mm. Um, I know exams can be very stressful. Um, when you're studying, I would say it's always, it can maybe lower anxiety to think about how what you're doing is a choice you made because you wanted to either attain a goal or what the meaning, what meaning does this have in your life? Uh, sometimes putting it back into perspective um, can help for exams. I think having a community is important. Having other people's where you can talk about either the stress of the exam or study with, uh, I would say it's helpful. I mean, of course, having some time to yourself to think and process or having a little bit of uh, alone time can be helpful to either recenter yourself, ground yourself and do activities, but don't forget that support network. And for competence, yeah break it down to smaller goals and 
uh, same same advice as that teachers would say it's not crammed the night before if you can split it out into uh, study sessions so you feel more in control and learning a little bit every every day and things like that that's basically what I would say and then use empathy with yourself to acknowledge that it is a stressful time that other people are also going through that stressful time and maybe you can acknowledge your your friends emotions mm -hmm. in the, in the, at the same time Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and for sharing all this brilliant and interesting research. So thank you to Dr. Vanessa Kurdi. And this concludes this episode of The Wellbeing Break, a webinar series on mental well-being. So I hope you all enjoyed the episode. So thank you very much for listening. As always, I highly recommend you to have a look at the University of Reading Essential page on the website where you can find all the services available offered by the university, as well as the RUSU page, the website or on Facebook, social media. And I highly recommend, as always, the Live Tools program, which offers a series of webinars every week on several topics from mental health, well-being to even study advice and study tips. So thank you so much. And I will see you to the next episode of The Wellbeing Break.